Okay, everyone. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome to another LexisNexis webinar as we go along, but I think we're going to start now. Uh, webinar. Um, it's Essential Skills for litigator, Litigators, and we are very happy to have Chris Marnovic here tonight, today to be presenting for us. Um, my name is Samantha Reddy, and I'm one of the content managers at LexisNexis. Um, I will be a facilitator, and um, yeah, well, I'll just go through a few house rules now before we start. Uh, Please, would you submit your questions via the Q&A tab? We will answer that. We'll have a Q&A session a little later on in the session. <clears throat> and please use reserve the chat box only for general comments and not the questions that you would be asking today. The webinar recording will be made available to all delegates a few days after the session. Please be aware that the slides will not be supplied um, separately, but the slide content will be fully visible on the webinar recording. Okay, um, as you all know, uh, <clears throat> sorry, as you all know, yes, to be a successful litigator, you need to have certain professional and personal skills. Those skills are important all the way from your first meeting with a client through the court process to the meeting after the appeal has been finalized. We've packaged today's webinar to assist students, young professionals, and even the more experienced civil and criminal litigators who simply require a refresher. We, like I said, we're very, very excited to have uh, Advocate Chris Manovic joining us today from New Zealand, where it's currently early evening, I think. Um, Chris is a senior advocate who has, been, who has written on litigation skills and taught the subject in both New Zealand and South Africa. He is especially interested in training of newly qualified advocates. His textbook, Litigation Skills for South African Lawyers, published by LexisNexis South Africa, is a prescribed work for LLB students, uh, candidate attorneys and pupil advocates. It includes not only the skills and techniques required for civil education, but also the skills and techniques required of a prosecutor and defense counsel in criminal litigation. This publication is essential reading for civil and criminal litigators. Okay, I think we can uh, hand over to you now, Chris. Uh, please, will you go ahead? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and for that introduction. Uh, I always enjoy the company of young people, especially people who have recently qualified in the legal profession. That is prosecutors, candidate attorneys, pupil advocates, and perhaps also law students in their second and last year at university. I wrote this book uh, in, I think the year was 2002, after teaching litigation skills in New Zealand, where I realized that the model that was being used for teaching litigation skills in South Africa was outdated and not fit for purpose. What was happening was that we were expecting pupil advocates to learn how to cross-examine, for example, by reading a book. That could just never work. It's the same as expecting your child to learn how to ride a bicycle by reading a book about it. So I wrote this book with a focus on practical skills and the techniques necessary to acquire those skills. As was explained in the introduction, the book covers the subject from the first interview with a client, and there are special skills required at that point already, right to the last appeal and the meeting one has to have with a client before closing the file and sending the client on their way. The book consists of five sections, uh, two of which we will deal with uh, today. Uh, the, could we go to the next tile, please? The next one after this, please. So the, the stages 
that we're talking about are pre-litigation, then pleadings, then preparation, then the trial, and then the appeal. Now, two of those stages the, are, are involved in the preparation stage. What you can see on the screen are, are two of the, the, the first two uh, of the listed skills there are the ones I call preparation. Those skills you can develop in your office, in your chambers if you're an advocate, you can do it at home, you can do it on the beach if you like, or in a cafe or a coffee shop. Fact is, those two items, fact analysis and developing a theory of the case involves paperwork and a lot of it. The next three stages, examination in chief, cross-examination and closing argument, I'm using to support a theory which I would like you to adopt as your operating system. It's called the theory of the case. The fact analysis will help you to develop that theory of the case. And in examination in chief, cross-examination and closing argument, you will pursue that theory of the case. The, if I could go to the next tile, please. The chapter dealing with fact analysis in the book is chapter 13. And then I could perhaps explain what you would be doing there by way of an example. Let's assume the client walks into your office and sits down, whether with an attorney or whether you are the attorney or not. The client sits down and you say, what, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? And the client says, uh, I've been arrested on a charge of murder. <clears throat> now this will seldom happen in your office. This will probably happen in the cells below the court or even at the prison. But the moment the client says, I've been arrested on a charge of murder, you will immediately have identified the branch of law that is involved. And in this case, it's criminal law. And you will also have identified the cause of action or the claim or charge or defense. In this instance, it will be a prosecution on a charge of murder. Now this, those were the two easy steps. What now follows is legal analysis. You will have to identify the legal elements of the charge of murder in order to pursue your consultation or interview with the client to find out where your case is going. Now, you guys have probably all studied criminal law at university and you'll know how to identify the legal elements. You go to a textbook, whether it's Birchall or Snowman, you will find the legal elements discussed there under or in the chapter dealing with the charge of murder. The next step in this process of fact analysis would be to identify the facts that you need to prove or that the prosecution needs to prove in order to prove your client's guilt. Now, this is not an exercise that you would perform in a vacuum. You would try to find the material facts necessary to prove each of the material of the legal elements rather involved. Let's say your client says, I wasn't there, I couldn't have done this. You would immediately know that the legal element which is relevant in this instance and is going to be the issue in the case is the identity of the person who killed the deceased. If your client wasn't there, couldn't have done it, then a defense like self-defense or absence of mens rea would be irrelevant. The only issue would be, was your client at the scene and did he kill the deceased? So you would concentrate on that in your preparation from that point onwards. For each fact that you want to prove, let's assume just for the moment that you're the prosecutor. The police came to see you with a police docket and said, we've arrested this guy for murder. He's in the cells down below and here's the docket. You would go through the docket to identify the evidence that is available to prove that the accused 
was in fact the killer. The police would probably have told you that his defense is an alibi. So you would concentrate on that particular element of the, of the charge. Could we go to the next tile, please? There are further steps in fact analysis, which are, two of them are not as important for this discussion. Uh, you would eventually consider the admissibility, reliability and sufficiency of the evidence, because it's no good to have a lot of evidence and it's not admissible or it's not reliable, or your witnesses are unavailable, or it's just not enough to overcome, for example, the alibi defense. But the most important step would be the development of a theory of the case. I'm going to deal with that in some detail. And I'm going to say to you here and now that the theory of the case is an element of your life as an advocate or attorney or prosecutor which is going to be at the forefront of your mind from the moment of the first interview to the finalization of the last appeal in the case. In any event, we'll get to that in a minute. You, once you have a theory of the case, you will develop strategies for the presentation of the case. Opening statement, evidence in chief, cross-examination and closing argument. And I'm going to show you in a minute or so how your theory of the case is developed, and then we'll go on to how you use it. Thank you. Next time, please. I've already alluded to this example where you are now assuming that you are the prosecutor. You'll know it's criminal law because that's the area of law in which you practice. And when the police arrive with a docket, that is criminal law. You will know because the police will tell you and it will appear on the face of the docket, this is a charge of murder. Your legal elements will come from your textbook or some cases that you uh, research and you will find, as I've listed them there, first element, which does not appear by the way in the textbooks, but in the court, that is issue number one. Namely that the accused is the person who unlawfully intentionally caused the death of a human being. Those are the five main elements. They can be broken up into smaller pieces, but that's really what they are. In step four of your fact analysis, you will concentrate on the facts that you can prove to show that the accused was in fact a killer. You may have his fingerprint on a murder weapon, he may have made a confession. Now those are facts. You would say, for example, the accused's fingerprints were on the murder weapon. Now that's easy to state as a material fact, but proving it will require evidence, for example, first of all, that the murder weapon was found in his possession or, or handed over by him. Secondly, there will be someone who has to testify that he or she took fingerprints off that particular weapon. Third, there will be another person who will say, I took the accused fingerprints. And fourth, there will be another person to come and say, I'm an expert in this field. I compared those two fingerprints and they're identical, which then leads to the conclusion that the accused is in fact the person who killed the deceased. Step five is where you line up your witnesses to prove each of the facts that you need in step four. I've now mentioned at least four witnesses just to prove one fact namely that the accused fingerprints were on the murder weapon. That's a process I say all lawyers follow to a greater, a limited or a greater extent depending on their experience. The more experienced, the more readily they will do this whole exercise automatically in their mind. They wouldn't have to write it down. But my experience, and I've, been in the courts for some 40 years. My experience has always been that it's best to write it down step by step so that you can use what you've written down to refresh your memory. Your case may not come up at the first opportunity and a year later when you're in court, you won't have to do all that preparation all over again, provided you have done it in writing. Could we go to the next part, please? 
We now get to the theory of the case. It is explained in detail in chapter 13 of my book. This, by the way, was the one thing I had never been taught. I found out about this in New Zealand in 1999, and I started appearing in the courts in 1971. So what is it, 18 or 20, 28 years, I practiced without consciously applying this process in my preparation for, for trials. This is your operating system. If you were on Microsoft, you'd be, this is Windows 10. I don't know what the operating system for Apple computers uh, is, but this is an advocate's operating system. What you will have done with your fact analysis is to identify the issue in the case. In the example we've used, it will be the identity of the killer. And in particular, the accused as the killer in the case. If you are the prosecutor in the case, you are locked into a position. Your position will always be, yes, the accused is the killer. If you are defense counsel, your position is always going to be, it's going to be determined by your role. You're going to be in the position where you're going to have to say, my position is that the accused was not the killer. Whichever side you appear in the case, you're going to have to marshal your best points arising from the facts and evidence to support your particular position. The prosecutor might say there were eyewitnesses, fingerprints on the murder weapon, he made a confession. The defense may say, no, he has an alibi, he wasn't there, couldn't have done it. The confession was beaten out of him by the police. His fingerprints were on the murder weapon because it was his, but it may have been stolen from. That kind of contrasting situation between prosecution and defense. If you're the prosecutor, you have to anticipate what the defense is going to be. And in this instance, it will have to be an alibi on our example. By the way, if the defense is an alibi, the accused has to give written notice of the alibi and the witnesses concerned so that the police may interview them. In any event, if you're the prosecutor now in our example, you will now look at this alibi and you will marshal your best points against it. That's step five in your theory of the case. What are my best points defeating this particular alibi? <clears throat> this process, steps one to five, can be applied to any issue in any case that you will ever have, whether it's a labor case, theft case, shoplifting, whether it's a civil case for the sale of goods that were defective or a purchase price that wasn't paid, every single time you will have to adopt this process in order to present a persuadable case to the court. Identify the issue, state your position, list your best points, anticipate the opposition's answer, and then marshal your best points to defeat them. Thanks, could we go to the next uh, tile, please? I've already told you this, so we can move on to the next, um, the next tile. We're now talking about examination in chief. Chapter 17 in the book. The purpose of the examination in chief of each of the witnesses that you are going to call is to find support for your theory of the case. Remember I said at step three of the theory of the case, you're going to marshal your best points. Now those best points are going to be the facts and the evidence that you're going to elicit from your witnesses. And similarly for step five, marshalling your evidence and facts in order to overcome the defense or the opposition. 
Our evidence or examination in chief, I can tell you, is of all the skills required for your appearance in court, the most difficult. It's difficult for a number of reasons. One, you're not allowed to ask leading questions. A leading question is one that suggests the answer. Secondly, you need continuity. You need the witness to be able to tell the story in chronological order. That is the most persuasive way to tell the story. And witnesses are fallible. So it, it's sometimes a bit of a struggle to get them to tell the story in chronological order. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And here's the most important point. Most cases are decided on the evidence led in examination in chief. Cases are not decided, in my experience, on cross-examination. Brilliant cross-examinations cannot overcome a good examination in chief. Witnesses usually stick to their story, and in most cases, my estimate, 80 to 90 percent of cases, witnesses actually come to court to tell the truth as they experience the events. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, how do you do it? I'm fond of the number five, you will have noticed by now. Five steps. The first is to create a timeline for the witness, that is a chronological sequence of events to which the witness can testify. Secondly, recognize the witness. In other words, go through the evidence of the witness with your witness before they go into the witness box. By recognizing, I don't mean schooling the witness, telling the witness what to say, but helping the witness to say what they know and how to say it. When you're in court, step three, break the witness in. A, something which has rankled with me for a long time is the way we treat witnesses when they come to court. We call them in from outside, and they come inside the courtroom, and they stand there, they don't know where to go, they don't know where to look, they don't know what to say. No one has told them where the witness box is and what they should do when they enter the courtroom. So first of all, tell your witness in advance during the precognition stage what is going to happen at the courtroom. If necessary, the morning of the trial, show the witness where the witness box is, tell them where to stand, tell them that there's a microphone, tell them to speak towards the microphone, but not to be overawed by it and tell them to speak towards the judge or the magistrate. Then you've got to break the witness in. Assume that your witness is nervous. If it's a police officer or a district surgeon or an expert witness, that might not be necessary because they've, they're experienced, they know what's happening. But your ordinary person who is called to give evidence in a case involving a motor collision, needs to be made comfortable. And you can do that with a few very ordinary questions. What are your full names? Where do you live? Are you married? Do you have children? What do you do for a living? And then perhaps, do you know any of the parties in this case? Let's assume it's a civil case. Do you know the plaintiff? Do you know the defendant? The witness says, no, I, I don't know them. Next question, have you ever seen either of them before? And the man has to say, yes. And you say, how did that happen? He says, I, was, I saw them at the intersection of X and Y streets because they were involved in a collision and I happened to be on the pavement. Now there's your introduction. The witness now realizes, man, these questions are not so difficult. I can answer them and they will be at ease. And your job as counsel or attorney is to make your witness come across in the best possible light. And a nervous fidgeting witness is just not going to look good. So if you've got your witness comfortable in the witness box, everything will flow pretty easily from there. Now I come back to 
than not in leading questions and getting the sequence of events out of the witness in proper order. The method that I advocate is called the piggyback method of, um, of examination in chief. What you do there is you craft each question onto an, a previous answer. There are examples in the book, but what really boils down to really is, is this. Let's say the witness says, I was at the intersection of X and Y streets. Your next question now uses an element of that answer for the next question. You say, and at what time was it that you were there at that intersection? He's used the word intersection, you use it in the question. He says it was 9.30. Your next question, and in which direction were you looking at that time? And he says, I was looking towards the west. And you, your next question is, looking in that direction, looking towards the west, what could you see of the intersection? And a man says, I could see the whole intersection, including the traffic lights. And then you can get to specifics. In which of the two streets were you? I was in Y Street. In which direction were you looking in Y Street? I was looking in the northerly direction. And what was the state of the traffic light for persons traveling north in that street? And the witness may say, it was red. And then you may say, and what did you notice while the light was red? And the witness says, I noticed the car coming at speed passed me into the intersection. And then you can deal with the whole situation like that. Each time, as I've demonstrated, crafting a question using the last answer. The witness will quickly get the message and the evidence will flow pretty quickly and in chronological order and you won't miss a single fact that you need to support your theory of the case. Towards the end of your examination in chief, you just have to make sure that you've covered everything on your timeline. Now the timeline will have the facts that we've discussed in a minute, a minute ago, where he was, what he saw, what the state of the light was, what the car did and all those things in chronological order. And when you've finished all of that, you've done your job, your theory of the case will have been supported by that particular witness. And we move to the next <clears throat> item, which is cross-examination. The good news is cross-examination is easy compared to examination in chief. Where examination in chief is chronological, cross-examination is thematic. What I mean by thematic is that you choose certain themes that you're going to use to ask questions of the witness. Those themes are prepared during fact analysis. In a criminal case, if you're defense counsel, you will have copies of the statements in the police docket. You will know what your defense is. You will know what the issues are, and you will be able to prepare questions for each witness by theme. The themes mostly are going to relate to reliability and credibility. Now, let me make it quite clear. The witnesses are not necessarily your enemy. You shouldn't treat them like they are enemies. Remember, they are there to provide evidence. And a subtle questioning of the witness can elicit facts that are favorable to your case. So that would be your first um, endeavor to try and elicit favorable evidence. I suggest, and that's on the next tile, that you adopt this approach. Could I have the next tile, please? First, say to yourself, did the witness hurt my theory of the case? If the answer is no, you sit down. Say, no questions, thank you. Second thing you do, say to yourself, can this witness help my case by providing new evidence, things 
that were not asked, asked that you think can help your case, then you elicit those facts. If you've elicited helpful evidence from the witness, you have a very difficult, tough decision to make. You have to decide whether you're now going to attack the witness or whether you're going to leave it like that. If you think the witness hasn't given you as, as much as you wanted, you may want to attack the reliability of the witness or credibility. Now remember this, reliability is about the witness observations, memory and recounting. I explained this fully in this chapter in, in the book. This does not attack the honesty of the witness. It's observations, memory, and ability to recount what they've, what they've witnessed. If you've decided to use one of these themes, you would cross-examine on each of them one at a time. Let's say that witness, we saw the collision at the intersection. You may cross-examine that witness on the basis that the witness was not concentrating on the traffic because he had no reason to do so. A few questions in cross-examination could, could pursue that particular theme in cross-examination. A few questions like this. Uh, you were on your way to university, yes. You had a backpack on your back, yes. You had a friend with you, yes. You and your friend were talking, weren't you? Yes. You had no reason to be concerned about the traffic because you were safe and on the side of the road, yes. And then you've now created a picture in the mind of the judge of two people not concentrating on the traffic or the traffic lights. And suddenly something happens. And you might be able in argument later to suggest that witnesses, this witness reconstructed the incident, only heard the collision and then looked up and saw the light was red, but might not have known what the color of the light was prior to the collision, because they weren't concentrating on the traffic or the traffic lights. Themes like that, um, I think there are about 18 of them developed as examples in the book. Once you've finished cross-examining on all of these themes, you have to state your version, put your version to the witness. Here's an old case, Brown versus Dunn, coming from way, way back in the seven, eight, sorry, 19th century, confirmed in the constitutional course in South Africa, in the case of President Mandela and the South African Rugby Union. You have to put your version to the witness so that the witness can answer. <clears throat> now in this accident case that we've just had, collision case, you might have to say to the witness if you for the defendant, I suggest to you that you had no reason to be aware of the state of the traffic lights at the time of the collision. The witness is going to say, no, I know, but you have to put that to him. And the next thing you might have to say to the witness is, I suggest to you that the light was green for the defendant's car when that car entered the intersection and that it was only after the collision when you looked up that you saw the light was red. Now, by doing that, you've now given the witness an opportunity to respond. He's not going to agree with you, but you've done your duty. In very, very rare cases, a witness might agree with elements of your defense put to him or in that fashion. Can I have the next time, please? I'm looking at my watch, which won't tell me the time when I want it. But we've got five minutes to deal with uh, this subject, cross-examination, but you don't do. The professor, the American professor who created this scheme is world famous in English speaking countries because he has created what he calls the 10 commandments of cross-examination. And you see them there. He says, you've got to be brief. And that accords with advice I received from a magistrate in Pinetown 
the first day I appeared in his court as a junior, I think I was 23 years old. He said to me, if you haven't broken the witness in 20 minutes, sit down because you're not just gonna make the witness look better and better. So be brief. Next item, ask short questions using plain words. How, how difficult is that? Short questions asking plain words. I read a trial record the other day and one question by senior counsel ran for one and a half pages. And the introduction to that question and the final question that he put after a page and a half were completely unrelated to each other. And then the witness said, I heard a woman screaming, something the witness had said 10 times before. So short questions, plain words, one fact at a time. What was the color of the light? Where was the car when the light was red? Not those two rolled into one question. Ask only leading questions. Leading questions are ones that suggest the answer. So you suggest the answer to the witness. I suggest to you that when you looked up, the accident had already happened and that's when the light was red. Next thing, don't ask a question if you don't know the answer. Next item, listen to the answers. Some cross-examiners write down all the questions they're going to ask, and then they ask them one by one without listening to the answers. And sometimes they get a good answer and they don't respond to it. They don't follow up on it. So you've got to listen. Here's one of the most important aspects. Save your argument and explanations for your closing argument. You're not there to argue with the witness, but to ask the witness questions to elicit evidence. Evidence that will support your theory of the case or undermine your opponent's theory of the case. That's all, it's really that simple. And sometimes in any event, when you argue with a witness, first of all, the judge might stop you. Secondly, the judge should stop you. And thirdly, the witness might win the argument. It happens quite often. And it's happened to me too, I'll confess. But it's a, it's a temptation I've been able to resist in my later years in practice because it always, it always hurts you. In any event, Professor Younger has four don'ts. Don't argue with the witness. Don't allow the witness to repeat adverse evidence. Don't ask the witness to explain. Avoid asking the question too many. I wish I had three hours and a large lecture hall so that I could give you examples of how things go right and how they go wrong if you don't apply these simple rules. Anyway, <clears throat> I am going to suggest that we go from here to closing argument, reminding you that cross-examination appears in chapter 18 of my book and there are examples of all of these uh, do's and don'ts that I've given you there. <clears throat> In closing argument, <clears throat> you've reached the stage where you now have to sell your theory of the case to the court. In the opening statement, which I didn't deal with um, earlier, you will have made a promise by way of explaining to the judge or the magistrate what the case is about and what your case is. Now, when you get to the closing argument, you have to demonstrate to the judge how you have delivered on that promise. And you are going to follow a process which is very similar to the theory of the case five step thing, but not completely so. First of all, by the closing argument, the issues will have clarified. Some issues might have fallen away, new issues might have arisen, they might be the main issue plus subsidiary issues. For example, let's take the alibi defense that we used earlier. That would be the main issue was the accused, the person who killed the deceased. But then there would be additional issues like was his confession admissible? Was it really his fingerprints on the uh, murder weapon? You would introduce those issues to the court saying to the judge or magistrate, 
These are the three or four main issues in the case that the court will have to decide in order to determine whether the guilt of the accused has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Then you may want to deal with those, with the of proof and the standard of proof in regard to the issues. In a criminal case, of course, we know it's proof beyond reasonable doubt with some exceptions. In civil cases, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove his or her case on balance of probabilities with some exceptions. So you would deal with that in advance so that the judge knows where you're heading. You would then take each of those issues and deal with them in accordance with that five-step theory of the case model that I explained earlier. You take them one by one. Alibi, fingerprints on the murder weapon, confession, whatever other issues there may be, each one of them. There may even be legal issues. You would deal with them in the same fashion. Anyway, you would need to pay particular attention to your opponent's case as part of that five-step process because you have to demonstrate that it is untenable. Remember, I think you might have done it at your moot court exercises at university. You have to deal not only with selling your argument, you also have to undermine and if you can destroy the opponent's argument. No argument is complete without it dealing with the opposing argument and disposing of it. You will integrate the law in your argument in the appropriate parts of the argument. In that five-step process, the law will come in at step three and step five. In step three, where you deal with your best points, your legal points will come in there as well. In step five, when you're dealing with your best points to defeat the opposition's theory of the case, you will deal with the law there as well. You will not sit down until you have told the judge or magistrate what relief it is that you're asking the court to grant. In a criminal case, the prosecutor will ask for a conviction on the main count or uh, alternative counts. The defense would ask for an acquittal. In a civil case, the plaintiff would always ask for judgment in his or her favor with costs and interests and so on. I'm going to alert you to something here in a minute. The defendant in a civil case would ask for the plaintiff's claim to be dismissed or better still for judgment in the favor of the defendant. The difference is significant. When judgment is granted in favor of the plaintiff, the case is over. If you ask for the court to dismiss the plaintiff's claim, the case is not over. There's absolution from the instance in that in case, and the plaintiff can start the case all over again, provided his claim has not become prescribed. So be very careful when you draft your pleadings that you always ask for judgment in the plaintiff's favor with costs. You do not ask for, as defendant, for the plaintiff's claim to be dismissed. They ask for judgment in defendant's favor. Have you got that? It is one area in which I disagree with what I've read in the best textbook um, you can buy on, on the drafting of pleadings. In any event, I think it's time to go to questions, is it? Yes, uh, Chris, if you want a few more minutes to complete, you, you may have that or we could go to Q&A. I think we can go to Q&A to give the participants a bit more time to ask questions. Great, thank you, Chris. That was really, really interesting. Lots of practical tips. Uh, I'm sure the attendees found it very helpful. In fact, I saw a comment earlier from somebody saying that you make it sound so easy and it's clearly not. Um, but that's from years and years of experience. And perhaps you could give some assurance to our attendees that following the rules in your book and practice, 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 that they too get them to that level of 
expertise. Well, what, I, what I can say about that, I can say two things. First of all, the forward, you know, the edition that came out in 2003 was written by Justice Krichler. And what he says, or said in a nutshell, is that, and I'm quoting, I've now been made to realize with considerable embarrassment just how ill-equipped I was for the advocate's profession. I'm even more embarrassed at being shown how inadequate my well-meaning but disorganized efforts at training has been. My copy of this book will become dog ears. I had dinner with him at his house in Johannesburg and he said to me, I only now realize how little I knew when I started practicing. And he, then he paid me the supreme compliment by saying, I think, I think if I'd had this book when I started practicing, I would have been a hundred times better advocate. That's the one thing I wanted to say. The other is this, when this book came out, the National Bar Examination Board promptly banned it because they said it made the exams too easy. And then to top it all, I suppose that's the best compliment I've ever had. The three copies of the book given to the Law Society Library in Durban <clears throat> were all stolen in the first week. Mm -hmm. well, uh, thank you, Chris. I was actually going to read the same uh, excerpt from that uh, forward. Um, amazing, amazing work. And I do enjoy the story about the banning of the book. Wow. Okay, I think we're just going to jump straight in, Chris. Uh, I think one of the first questions here is, um, why is there something about what do you do? Sorry. What do you do when your witness becomes a hostile witness? There's a particular technique for that. Um, first of all, you you have to ask the witness questions to establish that hostility. And since it's your own witness, you cannot do that by leading questions. It sometimes becomes obvious because you will have a statement of the witness and the witness then uh, goes against that statement, a written statement it has to be. Now there's a special technique for dealing with prior inconsistent statements. It's dealt with in the book, it, it's a six step process. It's dealt with in the book, that's the process you will have to follow. And then you can ask the court to declare the witness or hostile witness. Great, thanks Chris. Uh, there is another question here. Um, in situations where a witness contradicts themselves during cross-examinations, what would you recommend to be the best way to capitalize on the contradiction? I need to tell you two things about contradictions. <clears throat> Most inexperienced cross-examiners cross-examine with the purpose of eliciting discrepancies from witnesses where they contradict themselves and so on. That is usually not productive because no witness tells the story in exactly the same words every time. And the ones who do are the ones who have been schooled who are lying. Honest witnesses will have slight discrepancies within their evidence. It's actually a sign of honesty. Further, where there are small discrepancies between different witnesses witnessing the same thing, that is also to be expected because no two witnesses will have the same powers of observation, the same memory of the incident, the same dynamic intervention or involvement in the incident and the same ability to recount what happened there. So please don't focus too much on discrepancies. Focus rather on the themes for your cross-examination, themes that will support your theory of the case and themes that will undermine your opponent's theory of the case. Cases, I promise you, are not decided on cross-examination and the honesty or dishonesty of witnesses. They decided on the items of evidence that you elicit from the witnesses. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, I think this was touched on, but let me just ask you, how do you make sure that my cross-examination is not all over the place and it makes things to presiding officer? Now that's why you have to have themes for cross-examination. I'm just looking for the page in the book and I'll give you a few examples. Where is it? Ah, on page, page 360 of the book, I deal with items of, or themes of cross-examination. First, as to observation. Uh, you would ask the witness questions dealing with that, leading questions. Then you have questions about memory. Then you have questions about their ability to recount and to tell the story in the same words, more, more than once. You would cross-examine cross about bias, interest, corruption, prejudice, prior convictions, prior bad acts, prior inconsistent statements, even to reputation. Now, if you have identified those themes during your preparation, during the fact analysis, where you had the witnesses statements from the police dockets, and you could plan the cross-examination of each witness, you would have those themes, and you would never jump from one theme to another without finishing the theme first. So your cross-examination will then not be all over the place. It will be thematic and persuasive. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, we'll go on to one more question here. Uh, can you speak more towards Plascon Evans' rule and how you can utilize it, uh, utilize its mechanics in trial preparation to develop stronger theory of case and so better persuade the presiding officer? Uh, he goes on to say, I understand it's used for disputes of fact, but it might be useful in fact analysis. Plascon Evans is relevant to applications, motion proceedings not to trials. So the rule essentially is to the effect that if there's a dispute of fact between the evidence disclosed in the affidavits of the plaintiff and the evidence disclosed in the affidavits of the defend, the respondent, as it's called in application proceedings, then the version of the respondent prevails over that of the applicant. So th that's not really, uh, a matter engaging fact analysis in the model that I have in the book. The book is really about trial advocacy. Although it deals with applications, it's about trial advocacy. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, there are lots of notes of thank you here and for making everything sound so much simpler, um, which is a great testament to your publication and somebody did ask the question, the name of your publication, everybody, it is called um, Litigation Skills for South African Lawyers. Um, all delegates attending today will be afforded a 25% discount on that uh, book or ebook. Um, there will be um, details put up just towards the end of this um, webinar. I'm just trying to go through, see if any more questions. Uh, this was the latest edition of the book. It was published, was it the end of the year before, Chris? Fourth edition. Um, I think it oh, was. Let me look. Let me look. 21. It was the end of 2020, I think. Yes. So that's 2019. Copyright 2019. It came out in 2020. Okay, great. Um, Okay, oh, one more question, let's see. What would your approach to ex evidence in chief and cross-examination exam differ during a trial for a jury as opposed to a trial to be decided by a presiding officer? Yes, <laughs> though of course we don't have jury trials anymore. Um, a, a jury is more easily persuaded <clears throat> by material which is not really persuasive or relevant. 
but the judge would not fall for that. One of the problems of our past was that the jury system didn't work in cases where people of different races were involved. The juries were always white and men, and they found it very easy to acquit a white person charged with a crime against a black person, and very easy to convict a black person of a crime against a white person. <clears throat> so the system just didn't work. It was uh, abandoned in 1967. And when I went to university the next year, it was still on the statutes, but um, it was not applied in practice. Although in most of the old courts, you can still see the jury box. Oh, so informative. Thank you, Chris. Um, everyone, thank you very much for your time. Chris, I can't thank you enough uh, for giving us your time and your obviously your expertise. Um, you are an enigma. I'm not sure if everybody else knows about the fact that you are a very successful author of nonfiction as well. I mean, blew my socks off. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Please, um, all please note that the um, recording of this webinar will be made available to you a few days after this today. The slides will not be supplied separately. Um, we also, I don't know if this, we're going to have a poll where we just want to ask you a few questions. Um, please, if you have some time, just take you a second or two to go through that. Um, yeah, we, we trust you found our session useful and um, yeah, we look forward to connecting with you again soon. We will be hosting more of these webinars just to give something back. And, you know, if you have any suggestions, you feel free to email us. Um, in terms of the free giveaway, absolutely. Are we going to choose somebody who, one of the questions and the team will be in touch with you to provide that book to you. Um, right, so you see the question up on the screen, please will you answer it? Okay, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, and we will see you again soon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Thank you very much and best of luck with to all the participants in their practice.